One quarter of the world's poor live in India. 70% of the world's poor are women. In India, 96% of all female workers work in the unorganized or informal sector of the economy. These women have no regular salary or employer. They are paid by the day or earn a few rupees as self-employed workers. They receive no benefits. They often labor for that day's food. These women are the invisible arm of India's economy. However, they make a sizable contribution to India's gross domestic product. They are at the bottom of the work pyramid. As temporary construction workers, they are assigned tasks that men won't do. Everywhere girls underage are working, despite child labor laws, which frequently are not enforced. The children of impoverished women also suffer. These women struggle desperately in poverty. They struggle in part due to centuries-old attitudes related to the caste system and they struggle due to the invisibility of women. <laughs> Laxmi Ben started work at age seven she became a head loader at 10 when her mother was injured working. Her mother was also a head loader. For generations, her family has waited here for work, hauling textiles from the wholesale to the retail market. Laxmi Ben married a head loader at 14. A decade later, her husband started using alcohol and drugs. He ordered Laxmi Ben and their children to leave their home. She moved her family of six to her mother's. After five years, they left. She and her family slept under a shed of a school, even in winter and during the monsoon. Laxmi Ben said, Sometimes we didn't even take a bath for a few days because we didn't have hot water or a good place to sleep. I considered giving up. I thought if I lose courage and lose my life, then not only one life is going to suffer, but the other five will as well. I have to live for my children. I have to raise them, educate them, and make their lives. Laxmi Ben found work and training with the Self-Employed Women's Association, or SEWA for short. As one of their bank satis, she collected bank saving contributions of fellow head loaders at the workplace. She eventually worked her way up to the leader of the head loaders union. With Sewa Bank loans, she bought a house. Ultimately, she became vice chair of Sewa Bank's board of directors. With her children grown, Laxby Ben is pleased with what she has accomplished. She says, I am quite balanced now in my life. Pavarti Ben is in her 30s and is illiterate. She and her husband married at 16 and have five children. When her father-in-law became ill, she and her husband, shown here, borrowed money at 240% annual interest for her father-in-law's medical treatment and subsequent funeral expenses. To repay the debt, her husband left their village to live and work as a bonded laborer for the money lender. After more than a year, with the help of Sewa Bank, Pavarti Ben got a loan and paid off the money lender. Then her husband was able to return to the family. She no longer struggled to feed their five children alone. And Pavarti Ben now works hard to make every loan payment. 
forcing a worker into bonded labor or debt slavery has been illegal in India since 1976, but the law is often not enforced. And in India, a family's debt is often passed on to their children, effectively ending any chance of escaping exorbitant debt. As Pravarti Ben and photographer Tazy Berkeley walked together at the end of their visit, they were quiet because they did not know each other's language. But suddenly, Pavarti Ben stopped and turned, placing her hands under Tazy's dangling lens. As Tazy raised her camera and took two pictures, she realized what Pravarti Ben was saying. She was saying, See my hands, they tell my story. Nana Ben went through second grade and was married at age 15. She and her husband came to Ahmedabad with only seven rupees, or six cents. Difficult parts of her life include day-long manual labor for 12 cents a day, fetching 70 buckets of water a day, and cooking for 12 members of her in-law's extended family. Another was when the municipal corporation demolished her slum home. This forced residents to move beyond the city to a newly created slum far from their work. It was then her family was without shelter for two years. Nana Ben's grandmother helped her get a 500 rupee loan from Sewa Bank to buy aluminum vessels. Nana Ben traded these with neighbors for old clothes to stitch, wash, iron, and sell. We'd be up until two in the morning ironing because the next day we had to sell them. Nana Ben's biggest tragedy came when her grown daughter became distraught about her husband's drinking and gambling and their dependence on Nana Ben and her father for money. The daughter became so hopeless that one day she set herself on fire. She burned more than 90% of her body and lived for only 10 days. She died one hour after asking Nana Ben and her father to raise their grandchild themselves. Outside of Delhi, Dr. Kiran Beatty runs a school for illiterate children to get them enrolled in public school. It has a counseling center for women. This young girl was once a student here, but today she stood holding a knife and her newborn sister outside the health office of her brother's school. She was holding the knife to protect the baby from evil spirits. As hours passed, she appeared both frantic and trusting. Adults came and went, but still, she said nothing. During this entire time, the baby never stirred. Then a staff doctor came and checked the baby. The doctor said, this baby is ill. Maybe she has pneumonia. The baby and her mother are malnourished. If the family cares for this child, there is a 50% chance that she will survive. The counseling center staff explained that this was the family's fourth girl. The family had wanted a second son. What the doctor couldn't say was that this family does not want another daughter. In India, providing a daughter with a dowry can leave an impoverished family in debt for life. A daughter not married by her late 20s brings shame to the family. As a child of the slums, Raja Shri witnessed alcohol abuse. She also suffered as a child of domestic violence. Every day it happened here. The husband would beat his wife. I wanted to stop that. But when I tried to, they said, it is our problem. Don't say a word about these things. Raja Shri's parents tried to marry her off at the ages of 12 and 16. She connected with a helping organization. The organization told her parents, if you force Raja Shri to marry, we will file a legal complaint that she is underage. Her parents agreed. Raja Shri said, I decided that if I got married, 
there would be a vanishing of my life. Rajashree's community opposes educating women. At 13, she ran away from her village to the city of Pune to get educated. This garage cubicle is where she studied. Ultimately, she graduated first among girls from her high school and graduated from college. Now she is earning a law degree, aided by a Leela Punawala Foundation scholarship. Raja Shri says, It is my dream to make each girl legally literate. I would love to give free consultancies to poor women. I will fight for their rights and I will legally protect these girls. The question photographer Taisy Berkeley asked herself after witnessing these women's struggles and successes is this. The five women illustrate the complexities of India's invisible economy. The question I ask myself as a photographer is this, how many more generations of women will it take to bring about change?